So hello everyone. Uh, I'm really excited to be here with Arturo Briz um, on this uh, Blockchain Factory webinar series. Uh, it's, it will be the last one before holiday, and uh, we have Arturo Briz with us. Uh, actually, he's in Asia, I believe, and it's a pleasure to have Arturo. Um, I believe all of you know that Arturo is a professor at IMD. He not only ranks among the top 100 most uh, read finance academics in the world, but he also leads the, the world-renowned uh, IMD World Competitiveness Center. Uh, which is an award-winning, uh, he's an award-winning teacher and a, a program director. Um, and he's here to talk about cryptocurrency. And he also directs the strategic finance and navigating fintech innovation and disruption. So it's a great pleasure to have uh, Arturo and to hear him talk about uh, cryptocurrencies. And um, thank you, Arturo, for, for taking the time to have a conversation with us and to to hear you, your thoughts and views on, on cryptocurrency. Thanks again. The stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Rui, for such a nice introduction. Uh, let me first uh, express my gratitude to Porto Business School for this opportunity to be with you. As you may know, uh, Porto Business School is a partner institute in Portugal. Uh, the IMD World Competitive Center already started more than 30 years ago to analyze, study and measure the competitiveness of countries. And in all of the countries where we operate, and we're actually working on 65 countries, we, we work together with a partner institute, a local business school or public sector organization or private sector organization that helps us um, circulating our executive survey, gathering data, promoting the results, and all in all, making work possible. So I'm extremely grateful uh, to Porto Business not only for this event, but also for the loyalty during all of these years and for making our our work possible. In uh, today, I am not uh, here with you in my condition of director of the IMD World Competitiveness Center. I wore I wore these two hats at IMD. I work on competitiveness with my team, but I'm also, I'm primarily a professor of finance. As a professor of finance at financial institutions in, 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 in Latin America, in and my interest in, in blockchain technology and cryptocurrency grew over time. Not so much because of a natural inclination towards the field, but because executives were demanding more understanding about what was going on. And this is something that I want to share with you today. I know that you have been already attending several workshops on blockchain technology on, and on other applications of the technology. But today, what I want to do with you is to basically focus on cryptocurrency. And what I think is a real a change, disruption, a massive revolution that uh, has not happened in our financial system almost in the last few hundred years. So I think in that sense, we're extremely lucky that we're living through this revolution and this, for this time. I wish I a short presentation. Uh, the presentation contains some information, but on top of it, it also contains questions that I'm going to, to, to leave us as open for, for, you, for you or for, for us to discuss. So we move to the next slide. L let me explain the foundation of the ocean. If you look back 500, 600 years ago, you need to realize that our financial system is based on instruments that were designed to overcome the lack of trust on each other. Essentially, in the Middle Ages already, explorers, innovators, they needed money. They needed financing. Money didn't exist as such, as, as we know it today, but they needed money. And of course, financial markets were created, but in order to facilitate transactions, the, 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 the example that you have here is actually one of the first equity instruments that we have seen in history. That it has a lot to do with our history in Portugal, but also in my country, Spain. Capitulation of the same thing. 
he needed to finance his expedition to the Americas. Uh, and he went to Queen Isabella of Spain as the, uh, after to, to secure funding in Portugal. W went to Queen Isabella of Spain and said, look, you know, I need to finance my expedition to the, to the Indies, to be the Indies uh, but I don't have any money. So he signed a contract with Queen Isabella in which Queen Isabella said, I will finance the expedition. You can buy it. You can, you can finance vessels and, and, and people, and then you can navigate and, and find the Indies. The contract is that out of whatever you find, I will keep a percent. Okay? That's why this is an equity contract. Uh, out of what you discover, out of what you bring, out of any produce, including slaves, you know, I will keep a percent. Now, unfortunately, there is a chance that you don't come back. If you don't come back, I will get anything. But there is no way that I can guarantee that you will come back. So good luck, Christopher Columbus. You see, this is the origin of equity contract. And in fact, equity contracts arise in our history even before traditional debt contract. That is, governments and queens, kings, they have financing and also seek financing. And in these contracts, the main ingredient is trust. That is, I have to trust you that you will come back and you will return the money. If you return the money, I will make a lot. If you don't come back, then I'm taking all the risk and what can I do? So naturally and traditionally, and we can move to the next slide, you know, that was created together with money by kings and queens in order to borrow. So now we take it to the opposite direction. Now, there are queens and kings in Europe primarily that need to find work. They will do the they borrow from people. And you can remember the way they was they borrow from gold. They borrow gold because gold was the currency. Gold was valuable. The promise to return the gold was with a paper contract. And that was the origin of paper money. Paper money was a, in, in, indeed an instrument that was backed by gold until not long ago, as you know, until the 70s, by which kings and queens, queen, kings and queens were, would collect gold to pay for wars and other things uh, for, from, from financiers, Dutch, Italian. And then in order to guarantee that the gold would be returned, they would basically sign a promise that is called a bank note uh, that says, I will return the gold to you, okay? Of course, I use a numerator that I call uh, um, dollars or I call uh, escudos, and of course, this numerator becomes money. You see, essentially, money was created in order to overcome this lack of trust. Governments do not trust people, people do not trust their governments, and basically, governments have to sign this promise of payment that guarantees somehow such a payment. But the only guarantee that we have is the credibility, the personality, the reputation of the king or the queen. Okay? There is no a collateral in, in money. So what I want to tell you is that there has been no change in our monetary system, probably until the 80s, when the gold standard was removed, and then the promise behind money was completely empty. Now, central banks, governments, issue a piece of paper that basically promises that this piece of paper will be a value. But that piece of paper and the trust that you have in that piece of paper is actually not credible anymore. For example, banks and central banks can suddenly decrease or increase interest rates. Rates are the price of money. Banks and central banks can say, I'm going to go into the system, but I'm going to pay cent or 1% or minus 1% on that money. And this is totally arbitrary because the role of interest rates is totally arbitrary. This is where I want to start. Can I want you to think about that? Our monetary system is extremely old. It has not changed. And now we come into a massive revolution in which it's not only that 
money is going to be printed and issued by anybody, including or any private sector organization, not only central banks. And, and so, where well, this money is not of any physical nature, it's going to be digital. That is money that does not have a physical representation. Can we please the next slide? Let me ask you, you to think about, about this. Uh, Ken wrote, wrote or five, six years ago, this fantastic course of cash, where he shows what the problems are with the cashless society. So imagine that I fast forward to year 2025, and then I tell you that we live in a society in which there is no paper money that is, we live in a world in which there are no coins and all of our payments have to be made either with a credit card, with my phone, or with cryptocurrencies, that is digital money. Paper money is to exist. As you imagine, this is something that is very clean in some countries. Sweden, for example, has already declared a paperless money country. China is also very digitized in terms of money payment. We're very, very fast moving into a world in which there will be no coins and no notes. Everything will be made electronically. Question for you. What change in that context? Can you think of changes that would happen to our world if there is no paper money? If, if any of you can actually write through the chat, and then Rui can actually convey to me your, your, your it would be really great. So what happens in a world without paper money? It is at this time where I would hear you speaking. Of course, this is not possible in a virtual format. So I wonder whether there is someone writing anything in the chat. Yes, uh, there is. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so um, I was I was saying that uh, in this case, it's um, it's obviously a hypothetical question because um, by magic we would have to assume that all the paper money would disappear just because if people anticipate that paper money is, is to disappear, some, some of them will actually start stashing money, stashing money in their, mm -hmm. uh, in their safes and so on. But in the assumption that all states actually say, no more, no more money, we're not going to accept any more paper money, what will, uh, mm -hmm. what will happen? So uh, we're having some some feedback here saying no government uh, no governmental control, no exchange fees, uh, and that's the assumption of, of crypto, or that's probably an yes. assumption of, of uh, exactly. a wallet to wallet, mm -hmm. uh, exactly. cold wallet to cold wallet. Uh, then somebody says decentralized financial systems or system. Uh, so we're mm -hmm. getting some feedback here. Um, yes, but but I I don't want. So don't think just about the gold of cryptocurrencies. So don't think that I'm referring to a world in which we only have Bitcoin and Ether and we don't have uh, euros or dollars. I'm just talking about the world in which all of our payments, including in dollars or in euros, are digital. And they are digital because, for example, uh, tithers do not accept paper money. So you need to pay with credit card. Or when you go to Sara to buy a T-shirt, then you have to pay either with PayPal or with a credit card or just probably with cryptocurrencies, who knows? Okay. In principle, this seems like a very neutral change. That's why I wonder if anybody has thought about that because it's to me the biggest revolution that comes about with cryptocurrencies. Well, I'm. Uh, I can add a couple of. Uh, I can add my fifty cent. There will always be. Uh, I don't want to call it maximalists, but there will always be people that will say, "Well, um, uh, fiat exists 
so that we remain anonymous. And some of them will say, well, this is a massive, if, if this is mostly controlled by a central government or by multiple central governments, we're going to be in trouble. Or um, because people will always want some transactions to happen privately. So um, uh, here's some uh, here's some more comments. So some people are saying no more fake notes, no more tax evasion, saving paper, decentralized of uh, of financial so financial systems, uh, yeah. fees because uh, no fees or uh, fees uh, because there is no intermediaries. It's done by the blockchain more transparency, paper money will be residual in the future or no paper even, there will be more control and tracking. Mm -hmm. You see, and, and that's that, that I'm to is that we think of this as a world in which uh, someone else is going to be responsible for issuing money and so on. But the advantage is, first of all, full transparency. I mean, if you think about that, one of the why the Swiss National Bank is extremely uh, conservative regarding the issuance of a cryptocurrency in Switzerland is that the Swiss National Bank and hence the Swiss Confederation would know everywhere and every time where people and money is. That is, whenever I make a payment, the Swiss National Bank would know. And basically this destroys my privacy. In the very moment that all transactions are electronic, it will be extremely easy for anybody to check my transaction. And that's why you hear from, from our audience today that with this transparency, there is no fraud. You know, there is no way to, to, to launder and to move money across borders without, without any control. Um, let me actually point out into something that is very important and I want you to realize before we move into cryptocurrencies in particular. Two important points that I want to convey. First, as an economist, you need to realize that in the absence of paper money, all of our monetary theory totally fails. And what I mean is the following, is that uh, our models in economic theory are based on the assumption that interest rate cannot be negative. And the reasons why interest rate cannot be negative is that in the very moment that a central bank increases an interest rate of minus 10, people just take their paper money and put it in a box. And when you take money and put it in a box, then you don't suffer from the negative interest rate. You know what I mean? If you leave your, your money in the bank, the bank will charge you minus 10% interest rate. But if you take the money out, you can keep it under the mattress and you will avoid the impact of the negative interest rate. That's why it's really difficult to have negative interest rates. And whenever, for example, Switzerland has imposed them, it has been only for institutional money deposit not for individuals, because it's not possible. If the Swiss National Bank imposes negative rates, then people will take their money out. Of That's course. a very important question. Very important that we need to take into account. So uh, our monetary theory totally fails. Okay. Yeah, uh, there's, a, there's a different perspective here from uh, uh, an audience, which is, don't you think that the decentralized cryptocurrency will make the rich uh, even richer because the ones who own crypto won't pay the burden of inflation? Well, you see, that's what, that's a very good point. And actually, I'm going to I'm going to to question that argument because that's exactly I think some misunderstanding that we have. We think that uh, what we're going to call permissionless cryptocurrencies are dominated by a bunch of people that are becoming billionaires at the expense of, of others. What I'm going to claim instead is that the new crypto are actually based on a very democratic decentralized system that benefits everyone. And I, I, let me go back, let me go back. Yeah, this is, this is based on the assumption that uh, this is a good and, and very um, positive and optimistic um, uh, assumption that uh, all the population there's there's no income in, income inequality and there's no information slash knowledge inequality or technology inequality and this leads to the question from eduardo javier which says can vulnerable mm -hmm. populations might be or uh, vulnerable populations might be uh, mar marginalized essentially because they don't have that that uh, access true. true but notice that this extends to anything that has to do with technology nowadays 
that is in which cryptocurrency is a very small world. But when you look at, for example, uh, communications technologies, when you look at mobility, when you look at retailing, when you look at digital transformation in general, of course, those who have access to technology are left behind. And that's a macroeconomic problem that we need to resolve, certainly. Okay. Yeah, I think and a social as well. Exactly. And a, so, and a social in the sense that you will have to bank the unbanked, uh, yes. generate uh, financial literacy to the illiterate, and mm -hmm. additionally, you'd have to, uh, because you need to provide a bank account to someone that does not have a bank account, otherwise mm -hmm. that person will not be able to buy anything. And second, you'll need to, and assuming that all the payments are done digitally, at least mm -hmm. you need to have a universal smart slash phone that actually mm -hmm. does the transaction transactions based on that. So mm -hmm. that that's that game changing evening. Uh, mm -hmm. So how would you propose a solution that would, would uh, oh, deal with those look at, challenges? Look at the other side, because what we find today is that if you look at cryptocurrencies and fintech solutions in general, they are helping much more those who are not financially developed because they don't have legacy systems. That is, uh, some of the most amazing fintech solutions in the world today are taking place in Africa. Because in, Af in fact, in Africa, they don't have banks. For example, there is a, there is a company in, in, in Kenya called Empesa. That is basically a phone company that has created a bank. Essentially, what you do is that you load your phone with the money and then you can pay with M-Pesa everywhere. And of course, this is for people that do not have a bank account. So they, are trans they have transformed the monetary system. Basically, your, your money is in your phone. And it's essentially the case because people do not have bank accounts. So as I always say, fintech, in fact, is benefiting today much more those at the bottom of the pyramid because they don't have access to a legacy system. Uh, so as long as you have access to basic technology, then you benefit much more from fintech and hence you benefit much more from cryptocurrencies. Because if you think about the world with paper money, you need to have a physical network, a physical infrastructure to make physical money accessible to, for everyone. If we don't need physical money anymore, my money can reach anywhere, a, anyone. And, and it's much, much easier. But, but, the, but I take it, I take it. Let me focus on cryptocurrencies because I, I think I want to debunk some of these myths that exist about crypto. My perspective, as you can see, is extremely positive. I think that is going to mark an extraordinary revolution that is going to represent a disruption versus the traditional monetary system that is, at the end of the day, extremely, extremely um, problematic because the trust that we have in our governments is based on absolutely nothing. That is, today we are living through that situation, a situation in which, for example, central banks have decided to increase interest rates dramatically. What this means is that suddenly my money is worthless. Okay, That's totally, let me call it anti-democratic, in the sense that if I'm in the bank, by increasing the interest rates, now, the central bank has unilaterally decided that my money will be worthless in the future. You see, that is not different from what you could do today with simple cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. But people do not complain about central banks. People complain about cryptocurrencies. Anyway, I want to show you two slides. So if we can move to the, to the next slide to summarize our discussion about, about money, essentially, you know, a world without paper money will make our world more transparent and trustworthy. But this means that if we don't need the protection of the good guys, because everything is transparent, you know, the question is how you distinguish the good guys from the bad guys. And I think this image represents both. I mean, I trust that Her Majesty the Queen of England protects my value and my pounds. But I don't know, I don't know to what extent I can trust that Kim Jong-un, or his father here, actually, protects my money in my country. That is, you have to rely on having the right people protecting them, your money. And that's how we enter into the world of cryptocurrencies. Let's move to the next slide, because this is the most important slide of, of, 
of the day. I want you to I want you to give you a very simple primer, but I also want to help our audience to distinguish three types of cryptocurrencies. I'm going to be very careful. The first type of cryptocurrency is what I'm going to call cryptocurrency for idiots. I'm not I'm not insulting here anybody. What I'm saying is the following. You know, for for a cryptocurrency to become money, money in the in the traditional sense. Cryptocurrencies need to satisfy three roles. In a unit of account, a means of payment, and a deposit of value. Okay? This has been very extensively discussed in the past. Of account is very easy. As long as you can have something that is countable, be it, be it shells, gold, money, tokens, is money. Second, it is a, a deposit of value. That is, you can store it, and then that can represent value. And third is a payment. That is, it's accepted by people to make exchanges. So what we have today is that we have some cryptocurrencies that are only deposits of value. That is, they are investments. They are not accepted as means of payments. The examples are Bitcoin and Ethereum. I cannot go downstairs and buy a coffee from anywhere and pay with bitcoins. Maybe some people accept bitcoins, but today bitcoins or Ethereum are not cryptocurrencies. They're just a deposit of value in the sense that I can decide to buy them in exchange for euro. Then I think that the value will increase in the future, but nothing guarantees that this value will increase in the future. Okay. And many people have put their savings into these cryptocurrencies. And actually these two currencies are actually the only two one that are cryptocurrencies for idiots. Bitcoin and Ethereum first. Gen. Okay? So many of the complaints today about crisis have to do with these two. And I try to disregard those because these are not the important cryptocurrencies. The important is the ones that you have below. What I call cryptocurrencies with a business model. These are the ones that are going to revolutionize our monetary system. And they're going to serve as the basis for DeFi transactions and smart contracts to be used in NFT driven business models. You know, I know that you have already done that in previous in previous webinars. That is, these cryptocurrencies with the business model, they behave as traditional currencies. Essentially, what is the business model of the euro? The business model of the euro is twofold printed by the European Central Bank as a means of payment and a deposit of value that is accepted by everyone, including those outside the euro area. And second, it pays an interest rate, an interest rate that has been very low until recently, but now is reasonably high. Basically, it means that if I store money in my deposit account in the bank, the bank and subsequently the European Central Bank is going to reward me for having that money. Okay. That is the business model of a currency, is the interest rate that you can earn. If the currency pays an interest rate and that interest rate is decided by the by a central bank, essentially I am making money out of my money. And of course, it also means that I can generate credit, I can generate loans, I can generate investment, and then I can transfer my money in exchange for physical assets. And then I act the entire monetary and economic system. But the business model essentially the decision by the central bank to pay interest. Which currencies are the ones that have a business model? Well, all of the new ones, and I give you here some examples. If you exclude Bitcoin and Ethereum first generation, all of the others, Solana, ADA, Ethereum 2.0, uh, uh, even Ripple, uh, they have been cryptocurrencies with a new business model. And these are the ones that are going to mark an entire new revolution because our, our monetary system, our business models are going to change based because of these cryptocurrencies. NFTs, DeFi transactions, all of the things that we can talk about here. Okay. The third category of cryptocurrencies is cryptocurrencies for the future. And they basically represent the response by traditional banks, what I call the incumbents, to the permissionless blockchains, the privately issued blockchains like Solana, Adam, and the likes. 
But if what is happening today is that central banks are already in the process in many central banks, including the European Central Bank, the Central Bank of uh, of, uh, of uh, Norway, the Federal Reserve, no, the, the they they you know they are printing, they are issuing their central bank digital currencies. Okay, and we need to distinguish very well these three categories. So my overall summary of the three cryptocurrencies for idiots, they don't have a future. They are a nice investment, they will become marginal. Cryptocurrency with the business model, we are actually disrupting the business. The, the, the financial world with them. Cryptocurrency for the future, this is going to be a reality. In the sense that in the next 10 years, when you go to Sarah or when you go to Starbucks, you will pay with the, with the e euro or with the e dollar. These are cryptocurrencies that are issued by sense. And the, the same the same economic characteristic as traditional fiat money, but they operate in a completely format. Let me take you as an example in the next slide to to two to, ex, to examples of uh, of this type of, of, of cryptocurrencies. Okay, the first one is, is Solana. Okay, Solana is not Bitcoin. Solana is a very simple protocol that is generated in its own blockchain. And it's a cryptocurrency that is based on a proof of stake consensus algorithm. Unlike Bitcoin, that is built on proof of work, which is much more complicated. So proof of stake makes this cryptocurrency extremely efficient and fast. And it means that you can support many, many transactions in one second. Not scalable yet, but at least extremely fast. That is, it can replicate or it can substitute a central bank in, in dealing with the monetary system. There is a fixed supply of about 500 million Solanas. Of course, the price of a Solana has waited, but the fixed supply means that the concept of inflation and the concept of interest rates is extremely diff is, is really different. What I mean is the following. Central banks will constantly change the supply of money. So by constantly changing the supply of money, they are impacting inflation and interest rates. With Solana, the supply is fixed. And it basically means that prices will fluctuate, but the supply of the currency will be the same. It basically means that we'll become richer or poorer depending on how many people use the cryptocurrency. And the inflation rate, what I call here the inflation rate, think about that much more as an interest rate. And what it means is the following. When Solana started four years ago, it was decided by the algorithm, not decided by anyone, it's actually programmed in the algorithm that every year there would be 8% of more Solanas available yearly. It's like an interest rate. Basically means that if you hold 100 Solanas, at the end of the year, you would have received eight more Solanas. So you would end up with 108. That's why it's called the inflation rate. There are more Solanas, which in fact come from an interest rate. The system means prints out new Solanas every year. This inflation rate has been programmed to decline down to 1.5% in the very long term at a rate of 15% every year. That is, in the first year, the inflation rate was 8%. The second year was 8% minus 15% of 8%. And subsequently, little by little, the inflation rate will collapse to 1.5%. Today, it's about 7%. And what it means is the following is that if I have Solanas, at the end of the year, I will have increased my holdings by 7%. Okay, That's the way how the system, you know, uh, tries to prevent the natural inflation that would come from prices increasing naturally. But Solana, unlike Bitcoin or Ethereum, you know, is not subject to the decision by a few is one where I myself will benefit. Think about that. In Bitcoin, this inflation rate is only enjoyed by a few subset of people called the miners. These are the guys that become richer and richer. This is the inequality that one of you mentioned in earlier. In Solana, this doesn't happen because everyone will get this 8% or this 7%. So it basically means that 
as I keep my cryptocurrency, I will become richer. And of course, as people use it, then it will also generate a new monetary system in which inflation and interest rates are totally decentralized and are programmed. Basically, they are fixed. This is a dream because now I don't rely anymore on a central bank deciding what to do uh, with interest rates or indirectly with inflation. And as, an, as a last example in the next slide, I show you all of these potential projects that exist today on central bank digital currencies. This table can be somehow outdated, but if you look at all of the central banks, including Ukraine, China, Israel, Norway, of course, uh, Europe and the European Central Bank, the United States, there are many, many ongoing projects on e currencies or central bank digital currencies that are going to make a reality soon. I'm going to pay with e francs or e euros and I will not need any more banknotes. Or... If you put these two together, Solana from the private sector and central bank digital currencies from the public sector, from central banks, we have a totally new monetary system. This is the world of cryptocurrency that I want you to think about. Forget about Bitcoin, forget about crazy people, forget about miners, and forget about electricity consumption, which is only happening in, uh, in, in Bitcoin and Ethereum. The true cryptocurrencies are here to stay because they are making the world a much better place. Let me stop here because I know I actually said a lot and I want to test with you that you are fine and I want to hear your questions and your comments. Yes, there are a couple of questions. Uh, one is uh, about volatility. Uh, the other one is, is about protocols of proof of stake. And the other one is, is much more about transparency. So I'll mm -hmm. start with transparency. Um, the comment is, I think that to have more transparency, we should have a, a little less privacy. If someone is doing fraud or evasion, causing damage to public interest, that should be identified. In that cases, you know, or in those cases, social justice must be superior than privacy. It's probably just a comment, but uh, you can mm -hmm. comment on that. Yeah. Um, this the, the next question is is much more about volatility and um, and the fact that is 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 volatility, volatility seen in the cryptocurrencies as an argument that limits trust uh, mm -hmm. or limits the ability to trust uh, in a system of in a, mm -hmm. a payment a payment method as a payment method. Mm -hmm. And um, the final question relates to what do you think about Ethereum merge to proof of stake? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so fantastic questions. You know, like we can elaborate a four hour discussion about those because they're, they're fantastic, fantastic question. You know, the debate, so transparency is extremely, extremely good. And we tend to think that we all want transparency. So whenever, whenever you talk about, uh, about money laundering, people say, oh no, we need to prevent that. Well, here I give you an instrument that is called cryptocurrencies that totally hate um, a money laundering. Because especially when it is done by central banks, it makes all transactions transparent. Now here, then you have a dilemma because I agree with the person question asking that. I don't want the Swiss National Bank uh, to know everything that I do. I don't want the central bank to know that, uh, that I'm, bu I'm buying too much biking stuff or that I'm buying, uh, you know, uh, communist magazines or whatever I buy. You see, I don't want that to happen. So that's the debate. And that's actually why central banks today are questioning the technology. So there, there must be some, some trust, but also some, some privacy. Okay. And, and that's a very, very important moral or, or political, political debate on, on the transformation of Ethereum. So I will go to the third question first. You know, Ethereum 2.0 has moved to prove, uh, moved to prove of as a significant change in the business model. Because they said, you know, otherwise Ethereum based on proof of work is a, is a cryptocurrency for stupid people, for dummies. Okay? And, and that's why I think it has been a big transformation. Notice that this is happening in 2022. 
that is, Ethereum 2.0 was launched at the beginning of this year. So we still, we're still a long way, that is. This is, a, if you think that a monetary system has been developed in the last 1,000 years, we want things to happen in three months. And that's extremely difficult. This will take some time. And this takes me to the second point about volatility. Remember that today, cryptocurrencies are not yet of payments. These are only depositors, deposit of value. And this means that they are only investments. And as investments, they are volatile. The price is volatile. The very moment, think about that, that you can pay for an Amazon.com book or you can pay for a jean, pair of jeans in in uh, in Sara. You can pay uh, for a taxi ride with uh, Solana or with Ada. That is, once they become true cryptocurrencies, their value will not fluctuate because their value presented by that that everything that you can buy with them i know not but with, by, with people want to pay for it so that's the problem that we have today they are not yet cryptocurrencies but they will be soon because either through private, private uh, um, chains like ada solana ethereum 2.0 or central banks we are going to end up using them yeah I have a, an additional question, additional question, which uh, which is quite interesting re regarding, um, um, I would say, systemic risks. Why am I mentioning systemic risks? Because there's a, a correlation between cryptocurrencies, or at least with, with Bitcoin and any uh, Bitcoin-related uh, cryptocurrencies and, and uh, tech stocks. So they go almost mm -hmm. hand in hand. So if you have a systemic risk that affects uh, a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin or through technology, then it's a more vulnerable, um, let's call it currency. How would you comment on the vulnerability of, of a currency based on a tech systemic risk? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, the, the, the systemic risk here, I think, refers, refers I, I assume, to the idea that at the end of the day, cryptocurrencies, they lie on a technology solution. that They are in a blockchain. They are digital money. So what happens, for example, if the world runs out of electricity for one week? Basically means that we don't have any money because all of our servers, all of our devices would stream. So that's true. Or what, or what would happen if, uh, if we have a chip uh, shortage? which would yeah. actually change the, the flow of, uh, of, of uh, mm -hmm. let's call it processing or minting, let's put it, or True. mining. So yes. it's not just energy, but it's actual technology as well. Well, so on that front, I will say two things. The minting part is not technology demanding when we talk about the, the new cryptocurrencies. That is, in the case of, for example, as I said, Solana, the minting is automatic. So you don't need technology to mint, as for example, it happens in Bitcoin, in which you need computers to perform the proof of work algorithms. So that's very different. But it's, it's certainly true that at the end of the day, you know, we rely a lot on the physical aspect of technology to deal with cryptocurrencies. Uh, I would say that you know, as with the aspect of our digital formation today, you know, we are more depending on technology whatever technology means uh, so, so if you think it for example when i said about electricity or you you say about chips you know we're going to be more dependent on them yeah i have some questions coming in one is uh, an interesting one is it is it it's possible to evaluate the fundamental value of, of a, is it possible to fundamental uh, to evaluate the fundamental value of a cryptocurrency if yes how that's uh that's an interesting uh, question and the other one uh, from Leonardo is if the central banks start with e-money the control of the interest rate or inflation will be the same as today what is the difference to the actual situation yes so, so first of all so I invite you whenever you think about cryptocurrency do not compare them to uh, alphabet or to uh, uh, to Siemens uh, or, or to, uh, I don't know, Jerome Martins companies. That is, don't try to say, oh, what is the value of a cryptocurrency as if you were trying to value a company 
or you to value stock. The analogy is fiat currency. So I would transform the question into the following. How would you compute the fundamental value of the euro? So is there a method for that? And now people start thinking, what do you mean by the fundamental value of the euro? I said, well, exactly, that's what I mean. What is the fundamental value of a cryptocurrency? The fundamental value of a currency or a cryptocurrency depends on what you can buy with it and how much people accept it. How is that determined? Uh, you know, <laughs> this is determined by societies, you know, agreeing to assign a price to an iPhone or to a cup of tea. So is there a fundamental value for a cryptocurrency? No. Do we compute it? No. Is there a fundamental value for the dollar? No. Okay. Can I compute it? No. What happens is that today cryptocurrencies have a price in fiat money. But if you think about that, is that I'm expressing the price of Solana in dollars, which is another currency that doesn't have any fundamental value by itself. Okay. In that sense, it would be like gold. So that, that's the, 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 first, the first point. The second point was much more about the, the investment side of, of cryptocurrencies. Okay. Uh, so how do we substitute the mechanism? Well, the mechanism, and that's why I try to explain the, how Solana works, is that it's not arbitrary anymore. That is, decentralized cryptocurrency decentralized in the sense that there is no one that decides when the interest rate is going to be tomorrow or when the inflation rate is going to be tomorrow. It's already predetermined. And because it's already predetermined, and since I know the supply of cryptocurrencies, what will happen is that prices will adjust immediately down given that they have a fixed supply of the cryptocurrency. So there is not going to be inflation in the, in the way it's going to be always deflation because the supply of money is fixed. This is very different from the, the traditional system in which prices increase, but as prices increase, the supply of money has to constantly increase as well. You see? It's different. I'm not saying that it's better. It's just different, but at least it's less arbitrary. Okay? Uh, I have a challenging question on Solana's um, decentralized uh, Let's call it characteristics. So uh, Alexandra says, why Solana? According to SEC, Solana is not so decentralized and is considered a security, like a stock. So actually, yeah. Solana network was stopped several times in recent months. So how do you, mm -hmm. how do you comment on this? Yeah. Don't, don't take my state, Solana, as, a, as a, like a, I, I think that changing is solving in all problems. I just wanted to give you one example. But second, also, the US regulation is not the most favorable to cryptocurrencies because it's extremely defensive and protective of the current finance system. So, of course, the US regulation, most of these cryptocurrencies have been considered financial instruments. The reason for that is that by declaring them financial instruments, they are regulated by the Securities Exchange Commission. Okay. Uh, that's very tricky. Okay, that's very tricky because, of course, if you want to have them under the purview of the federal regulation, you need to declare the instrument. But it's not clear to me that this is the case. And in any, if you look at other countries, from Singapore to the UK, from Switzerland to the Netherlands, they're much more open and much more progressive than the United States. If you think about where the, the most interesting solutions from the crypto space come from, they don't come from the US. Okay. They come from Europe, they come from Asia. Okay. And this is where the most pro the, most of these protocols have been born. If they are born in the United States, like for example, happened with, then they move in the Netherlands because the Ethereum Foundation basically was incorporated in Switzerland because the US regulation was not was not uh, favorable enough this way. Okay. Uh, another question that is coming in is, is regarding uh, CBDCs, which, um, which is a question that uh, is based on a statement. CBDCs will uh, be controlled by the states, but the states will create their own blockchain or will opt for mm -hmm. one already on the market. Uh, and that's more mm -hmm. of a question is, will they, will they go for something that they create on their own or will they go for mm -hmm. something that is already 
be on the market, like Ethereum, BNB, ADA, FTM, and so on, mm -hmm. or yeah. something that is more created by companies like Circle or Peter. Uh, what is mm -hmm. your state? What, what's your perspective on this? Yes. No, of course. So, so the main challenge to CDBCs is purely technological. That is, we're trying to solve some of these issues that have to do with, first of all, um, how to how to balance transparency with privacy. Second, how do I control the transmissibility? Control is not the right word. How do I make it possible the transmissibility of the cryptocurrency in the right way? That is, how do I implement national wallets? Let's say for my currencies. Um, and third, how do I make how do I make it scalable? That is one of the problems that we have today with the traditional blockchains is that they are not scalable. There are blockchains. So you can only add transactions. Think about that. You can increase the length of the database. You cannot increase the width. Okay? It's not scalable. So it's a technology problem. I invite you to follow a company in Estonia that is called GuardTime. GuardTime is considered to be the largest blockchain company in the world today and is providing most of the central banks with the solution for their cryptocurrencies. And it's basically a different blockchain where they can nest their cryptocurrencies. But central bank currencies are not going to be Solanas or others. They're going to be independently issued E-francs and E-pounds and E-dollars, each of them with different technical characteristics. Well, as you mentioned in our time, uh, what, how would, would your, what would be your comment on DAGs or directed acyclic uh, graphs like uh, Ether hash graph where performance is not an issue and scalability as well? Uh, would, mm -hmm. And it has a consortium that was, was, was pretty known. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what would you say are the limiting components of the growth of a protocol? Yes, uh, it's, it's, that's the problem because now we have too many protocols coming out. And of course, there's going to be a winner takes all. At the end of the day, we will need just one. Uh, there is competition today between all of among all of them. Uh, and Dax and, and, and Solana and Cardano, they are competing. Uh, I think if we solve the scalability problem, then we're going to have the unique protocol that will be used by everybody. And currently the price. That's why also there's also so much volatility. That's why people will bet on Solana or on other or the others, but there is a lot of volatility. I think at the end, and I say at the end, I'm talking about not the next three, four years, probably longer, because it's going to take some time. We're talking about we're talking, as I said, about the crusade that took like a you know five hundred years for our monetary systems. Why do we want to do it in one year only? Okay. So I believe that um, uh, that we have uh, some some uh, not more not many more questions coming mm -hmm. in, uh, but yes. um, the, um, the the thing that remains uh, of interest, uh, I think most of the, the people that are, are on the on this webinar is how do you what what would you consider the most critical factors? to determine the success of, of a protocol. Uh, and uh, because you're mentioning Solana, we've talked about Ethereum, mm -hmm. uh, and you, you're actually mentioning other networks and uh, other players. Uh, and you also mentioned the winner takes it all strategy or what mm -hmm. some people call it a hungry protocol uh, approach. Um, do you think that this, um, that this is not something that can be solved uh, in the next five years, or you think that uh, consolidation mm -hmm. may be the, the next uh, move in terms of blockchain, or you think that the future will just be hybrid in the sense that uh, you'll have open dots and, and Cosmos as a, as a building mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. bridges between uh, blockchains. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, I, I think I I think the solutions are already there. Uh, as you say, I think what it takes time is the consolidation. That is, we need to all agree. Uh, most of you are, are too young to remember what happened with VHS versus Betamax and so on in the old days, or what happened with Apple versus, versus Windows or the other operating systems that we had before. Okay. At the end of the day, there was a, there was a consolidation, and we ended up with two operating 
this internet and then we, we ended up with one video technology uh, uh, alone out of three so i think the same is going to happen that's what will take a long time because um because adobe is actually is actually slow and and you know deciding which platform and which blockchain is going to be your optimal solution for your nft or for your smart contract is a difficult choice today okay uh, the other the other point that is is quite interesting and that I sometimes get from a lot of students relates to the fact that um, as um, as the technology evolves, um, we'll go into higher higher levels of abstraction, especially with DAOs. Uh, what would you say are the enablers or the accelerators mm -hmm. that cryptocurrencies will have on DAOs? Yes, so, it, so it, it, they will go in parallel. That is, for any for any DAO solution, for any business model application of a blockchain, you need to have an asset. That is, you need to have a cryptocurrency, uh, and that is the same as what happened with DeFi with DeFi product. You need to have an asset. Uh, and today, you see, pro probably Ethereum is the dominant uh, currency in DeFi transactions. Uh, but Solana and Nada are actually the winners in the smart contract space. So they will move in. Okay? And, and also, an open one will be again the winner, as I said earlier. It would, be, it would be nice in any case if you saw my light. Uh, for anybody that wants to have additional questions or, or comments, you know, you can use, uh, you can use uh, my, I can give you, I give you my coordinate in the presentation and you can. Connect, connect with me through Twitter. If you have to, if you want a discussion about that. Yes. Uh, additionally, uh, we do this to all the faculty that is uh, either presenting or doing running a webinar, which is basically we're inviting uh, the faculty to become members of our mentor pool for projects in mm -hmm. blockchain based on the, uh, the executive program on blockchain that Porto Business School has. And uh, you're, we are obviously extending that invitation to you, and we'd be very honored to have you if you would consider in mm -hmm. some day, some time uh, to mentor uh, projects that are based on mm -hmm. blockchain. So that's, mm -hmm. that's something that is quite interesting. Uh, I think of I'm course. having, oh, oh, thank you very much. I think I'm having one of the last questions which uh, relates to, and I'm not sure if the, uh, uh, Arturo knows all the coins because there are thousands of coins, but there's yes. a, a, a new coin called AL. Uh, so I'm not sure if uh, this is a this is a, a, a relevant coin in the the space in terms of uh, in terms of the proposal of the coin or the or the way that the coin delivers mm -hmm. uh, specific value. But um, okay. there, go ahead. And I, I don't know that one, so yeah. there are too many. Yeah, so many, exactly. I, I, I totally. So um, on, on the other hand, my uh, my final question is, uh, if you have to, um, I don't want to say advice, but uh, if you had to uh, look into a cryptocurrency that would uh, that would make you or would put you in a more comfortable situation. And, and I know you've mentioned Solana quite, uh, but a, as you know, uh, a lot of people did not foresee uh, Binance, uh, uh, the Binance cryptocurrency, as, as well as other cryptocurrencies that were, uh, that gained uh, traction. Uh, what would you say would be the criteria for someone that is uh, coming into crypto investments uh, or the set of criteria that for that person to look other than just reading the white paper uh to look in terms of and obviously at the adoption and number of uh of uh pool use pool of users mm -hmm. what would you say would be the criteria for uh something that could mm -hmm. be a, a more serious investment yeah I, you know so it is very often difficult to understand all the white papers in the world Sorry. But my main, my main, my main criteria usually is the credibility of the team. That is, as as it happens with the internet, or as it happens with technology, 
is that if you have a team that is because of their experience, because of their profile, because you know their, you know of their uh, previous previous adventures, then I go with it. Because otherwise, you know, you end up with the new newcomers that you know where they come from. They promise you the the moon, but uh, but it's, it's you know it, it, there's no guarantee and it's difficult. So I normally believe in teams and believe in people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, great great advice. So uh, great final advice and uh, final comment. Again, thank you very much, Arturo. I know that you you've taken your time and you've. Uh, you're traveling and it's it's been a great time and I'm, I'm thinking on behalf of Puerto Business School and all the audience uh, for your time and your your insights and uh, hope to see you very soon uh, either on IMD in IMD or at Puerto Business or in, School. Or in Porto, next time in Porto. Yes. In Porto it has to be, next time it has to be in Porto. Thank you so much. Thanks right. again for your time. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.